So good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to present today Professor Rocio Segura. Uh, she is, uh, although she's very young, she has a, a relevant uh, background in, in a very interesting, I would say, research topic. Um, and also a strong experience, not only technical and scientific, but also geographical. She was born in Argentina. She studied uh, civil engineering there. Uh, then she did her PhD in Canada in the Sherbrooke University. And uh, her field of research uh, includes some of the some keywords or, or topics that are quite uh, uh, relevant to our research in FIMNE. We're talking about numerical modeling, uh, risk assessment, but also reduced order models, fragility functions, uncertainty quantification, and machine learning. Uh, well, these words are, are quite uh, familiar to us, uh, to many uh, research groups in FIMNE. But uh, uh, the particularity of uh, this research is that, uh, on the one hand, she has been working in close cooperation with the industry, uh, most of her, of her research. So she is very focused on trying to bring those concepts into practical, uh, the practical applications. And on the other hand, well, she, she was with dams, and that's, that's one of our main topics of research. So that's why we, we, we think that the, her research is quite interesting to us. She is visiting us for this month, and we took this opportunity to invite her to, to give this seminar. So, well, Rocio, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, OK, thank you so much, uh, Fernando, for the introduction. So um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for your attendance um, for my presentation. Uh, the presentation is entitled Parametrized Seismic Fertility Functions for Gravity Dams. Uh, and it's an approach including the effect of updated model parameter knowledge. And um, I wanted to start this presentation um, by telling you that the, res the results that I'm going to be showing you today, as Fernando mentioned, are part of, a, of an ongoing research project that is conducted um, in collaboration with the industry. And as such, the main idea is to adapt the procedures that we develop in an academic settings to the practical needs of the industry. So we can find ways of uh, redirecting economical resources into the study of those parameters affecting the behavior of the structure the most. So here in this slide, I have the keywords of our research project. And those are basically uh, the motives behind um, this research. So um, we know that aging and its associated problems for structures, together with new methods of analysis and for estimating natural hazard, together with increasing society demands to ensure higher levels of safety, has resulted in the need to review and upgrade methods for safety assessment. And just to give you some insight into the context and the problematic that we're treating in this study, um, we're interested in dam systems. So that's going to be the focus of our project. And when I'm talking about dam systems, uh, it's more specifically a gravity dam and a free crested weir. Those are located in the province of Quebec, which is in Eastern Canada. And we're working with an industrial partner that is Hydro-Quebec. And here I want to point out that there are about 1,000 large dams in Canada, and 30% of those are located in Quebec, where half of the population live in potential flood zones. That's why dam safety must be a priority. Uh, with respect to the loading conditions, we're focusing on loading due to seismic events. And that's mainly because um, the documented seismic activity in recent years has led to the consideration of Eastern Canada as a moderate seismic zone. And finally, for the methodology, we're going to be applying a probabilistic analysis using fragility functions. And this method was deemed to be more adequate because it's based on um, statistical methods where all of the parameters can be considered as random variables. And that's going to allow us to include their respective uncertainty. So the main goal of this project is to assess dam safety against seismic hazard 
using a probabilistic approach. But as we know, uh, this is very time consuming and can be computationally very expensive. That's why we decided to apply some machine learning techniques uh, such as surrogates or metamodels so we can make this research viable. And maybe it goes without saying uh, presenting this here, but when we talk about machine learning, we know that we are talking about methods that they're going to allow us to learn from the data, the relationship that exists uh, between the quantities of interest. And within this family method, um, a surrogate or a meta model. Those are, um, I just wanted to clarify the terminology that I'm going to be using uh, throughout the presentation. So I'm going to be using these two words as synonym. And here we're talking about um, an algorithm that is going to act as a curve fit to the available data. So we can um, use our algorithm instead of an expensive simulation program. So we're going to have some kind of input data that's going to be uh, in terms of material properties, geometrical uncertainty, and loading conditions. Then we're going to perform some simulations. And then we're going to have our output data, which is going to be the structural response that we're going to use as training, uh, as training points so we can adjust our algorithm. So um, the main objective is to evaluate the seismic vulnerability of done system components within a performance-based uh, probabilistic framework using meta models. So the whole methodology is divided in three components, and those are applied in a sequential way. That means that the results of component one are going to be used in component two and so on. So the first component includes the model generation and the seismic scenario. So the first thing that we need to do here is to identify key parameters. So here we're talking about material properties and loading conditions. Then we're going to generate our numerical model. And finally, we're going to do the seismic characterization at the dam site. Then we're going to be using those results into the component number two, which is the first layer of our surrogate. And here we're talking about a regression algorithm. That means that we have a continuous output in our case is going to be the base lighting safety factor. And then we're going to try to emulate and replace that numerical model. Then we're going to be using this first layer to generate train points. So we can uh, train our component number three, which is the second layer of this surrogate. So here we're talking about a, a, we're talking about a classification meta model. So we have a categoric output within the range O1. And that's going to be convenient for us because it's going to allow us to develop fragility functions so we can perform a safety assessment. And uh, the whole methodology that I'm going to be showing you today, it's applied to two case studies. And the main idea for this was to show that the methodology is robust enough to deal with different kinds of parameters. So um, the first case study is a free crested weir. And here we're going to be focusing on foundation stability. Um, and we're going to be using a multiple wedge analysis for this. Uh, for case study number two, uh, we're going to be using, uh, we're going to be focusing in a gravity dam. And we're going to be um, interested in the dam foundation sliding stability. And just as a color fact, this dam was chosen because it's a uh, simple and quasi symmetric and it has a well-documented dynamic behavior. So that's going to allow us to also calibrate our model. Um, so for the numerical model, we consider that the talus monolith of each structure, it was representative of um, the structure in general. And we're going to be using the software CADAM 3D. Uh, for, with this software, we're going to be performing a stability uh, analysis based on the limit equilibrium methods. And the loads that we're going to consider include um, self weight, hydrostatic and hydrodynamic loads, uplift, and seismic loads. So, um, given that we're going to be using a probabilistic analysis uh, for do the seismic characterization at the dam site, we thought they would be consistent to do a probabilistic seismic hazard analysis. And here, I just want to point out that um, concerning Canada seismicity, 
Um, the seismic hazard maps were completely um, within a deterministic framework until 2005. And as of 2010, they start working with a probabilistic approach. And um, here in the latest version, which is the 2020, we are, we're talking about a fully uh, probabilistic approach to estimate the seismicity uh, of Canada. So uh, what are we talking about when we say probabilistic seismic hazard analysis? Well, basically we're trying to estimate the probabilities of exceeding a seismic intensity measure at a given time span and at a specific site, considering all possible earthquakes that they're going to be defined in different seismic sources. Um, in our case, the seismic sources, we consider the sources provided um, in the National Building Code. Uh, we're going to be using models that they are um, that they are consistent with Eastern Canada. So that's going to allow us to use ground motion models to predict the seismicity in that region. And here we're talking about return periods uh, within the range of 100 up to 2,475 years. So um, here in the table, we have the peak ground acceleration provided by the National Building Code. And all of the values are provided in terms of, um, sorry, for a specific return period. We can see that this return period goes from 100 up to 2,475 years. And here we're considering different editions of the National Building Code to see how PGA is varying with each edition. And we also have the values, um, the values that uh, our industrial partner use to do um, an internal analysis. So uh, here we can just point out that the 2005 um, edition is uh, it's more conservative. Remember that here we're talking about the deterministic analysis. Um, 2010 and 2015. Uh, they are less conservative and they are like really similar to each other. So here we start talking about the probabilistic approach. And we can see that in the 2020 edition, we have intermediate values. And this is due to the consideration of seismic sources that we weren't considering in the previous um, editions of this national building code. So I also want to point out that uh, this national code is for buildings. And in North America, normally we're going to be working with seismic events with a probability of exceeding of 2% in 50 years, which is equivalent of an event with a return period of 2,475 years. However, when we're working with that time systems, we're looking more at an event with a return period of 10,000 years. So what we did here, which is allowed by the National Building Code, is we took the values of the latest edition and we extrapolated the PGA values up to a return period of 10,000 years. So the resulting peak ground acceleration, it's 0.33 G. That means that if we want to efficiently cover return period ranging uh, from 100 up to 10,000 years, peak ground acceleration must be varied between 0.02 and 0.35 G. So, now that we have already uh, generated our numerical model and that we have already characterized um, the seismicity at the dam site, we're going to proceed to the generation of our surrogates. And here, um, it is going to be the same methodology. Either we're talking about a regression or a classification metamodel. So we're going to have an output of interest, and that's going to be equal to a mathematical algorithm that is going to be a function of a set of covariates. And here we're talking about uh, material properties, geometric parameters, and loading conditions, plus a lack of return. So the generation procedure is going to be the first, uh, it's going to be the following. So the first thing that we need to do is to generate training points. For that, we're going to be using an experimental design matrix for simulations. Then we're going to conduct the simulations for each row of the experimental design matrix. And then we're going to fit algorithms, regression or classification. And we're going to choose the best one based on um, predicting cap uh, predictive capabilities. So um, for our first layer, so the first layer of, uh, of our surrogate, here we're talking about the regression. So we are talking about the continuous output for a specific configuration of the parameters. Um, 
And what basically our final um, objective here is to replace the numerical model. So we want to stop using our software. And I'm going to start uh, with the training set for the case study number one, which is the free crested weir. Um, so here from field measurements, they identify four um, diaclases, which are F1, F2, F3, I don't see it here, and F4. So with those four families of diaclases, they, we estimated that they were possible, these four wedges um, at the foundation. And we also consider like not only these four cases, but also four subcases. So here we're talking about 16 possibilities. So uh, the first subcase, it's the wedge directly under the structure. Subcase so number two is with the upstream joint under the reservoir. Subcase so three with the downstream joint extending from the foot of the structure. And subcase so four is a combination of subcases so two and three, that is with the upstream joint under the reservoir and the downstream joint extending from the foot of the structure. So um, after performing all of this analysis and exploring all of the possibilities, uh, we determined that the most critical case was uh, the wedge that was formed with uh, diaclases uh, F1 and F2. And from field measurements, we know that um, the upper end dip for F1, it's 29 degrees, for F2, it's 11. And we also have a minimum uh, and a maximum spacing. So that was all the information that we have. So uh, the training data set, for this free crested weir include eight parameters. These parameters are, showed, are shown here um, in the table. So we can see that we have cohesion, uh, angle of friction, deep and spacing of the two diaclases F1 and F2, reservoir elevation, and peak ground acceleration. And here we're assuming a uniform distribution for all of the parameters because we consider that our knowledge is limited to a lower end and upper value. So uh, we're going to use a progressive Latin hypercube sampling strategy, and we're going to generate 200 samples from the variables in the table. And we're going to be using a regression, a regression algorithm that's a polynomial regression, and the output of interest is going to be the foundation safety factor. For case study number two, this is a little bit more straightforward. So we're working with the gravity dam. Here we're considering only five input parameters, which are shown here in the table. Again, uh, all the uniform distributions limited to a lower and an upper value. And here we're talking about cohesion, um, angle of friction, drain efficiency, reservoir elevation, and peak ground acceleration. So here, just want to point out that we're not varying the geometry because it's a case study dam. So we're assuming that the geometry of the dam is not changing. Uh, for the regression algorithm, we're talking about a polynomial regression. And here, the output of interest, it's a sliding safety factor at the interface between the dam and the foundation. So uh, to evaluate the surrogate performance, we're going to estimate the goodness of fit. And that is the discrepancy between the observed values or the values that we obtain with our, with our software and the estimated values with our algorithm. So we're going to consider some global estimates, uh, for example, the coefficient of determination and the root mean square error, and some local estimates, such as uh, the relative maximum absolute error. And here, I just want to emphasize that the metamodel performance is based on tenfold cross-validation because we want to avoid overfitting. So um, here I'm presenting you the two uh, final algorithms that we're using for case study number one, that is the free crested weir and the gravity dam. Um, starting with case study number one, I just want to point out that our safety factor at the end was a function of um, six parameters. And we're talking here about a polynomial uh, of order three plus a lack of hit error. And here it's interesting to see that we have only six parameters and we started with eight. And that is because we perform a feature selection and we end up seeing that um, the geometric parameters relative to the diaphase F1 wasn't significant for our um, algorithm. 
So we were able to estimate our safety factor with only six parameters. Uh, for case study number two, which is the gravity dam, we use the same five input parameters. And we can see here by looking at the coefficient of determination that we have a fairly well um, performance of these two um, surrogate models. So um, now that we have our first layer of the surrogate, we want to use all of those parameters so we can generate training uh, points for, uh, for the second layer, there is the classification. So here we're talking about the categorical output again for a specific configuration. And we're going to be looking at two, uh, two classes. Uh, when I have a safety factor that is smaller than the objective, and when I have a safety factor that is greater than the, than the objective. So here we can be looking at unsafe and safe. And with that, we're going to um, perform a fragility analysis. So uh, for the training data set, uh, here's going to be the same for both. We're working with the same variables that I showed you in the table before. So uh, here we decided to generate 10,000 samples. So we have 10,000 uh, material properties, 10,000 PGA values, 10,000 uh, possible web geometries, and one fixed geometry for the dam. Uh, the classification algorithm is a logistic regression. And the output of interest, it's a binary variable. It's going to be one if the safety factor is smaller than the safety factor of interest, and it's going to be zero otherwise. And this target safety factor needs to be greater of equal uh, to 1.1. That is the case if we have some knowledge in terms of the material test at the dam site, or greater of equal to 1.3 in case we have no knowledge whatsoever of uh, the material at the dam site. Um, here I'm presenting you the um, confusion matrix for the free crested weir and for the gravity dam. And we generated two uh, algorithms for each um, case study. So one for a safety factor of 1.3 and another one for a safety factor of 1.1. And here we can see from the classification error, which is smaller than 7% in the regressive wear case and smaller than 8% for the gravity dam, that um, the um, prediction capability of our surrogate is fairly good as well. So uh, we decided to work with a logistic regression because this is giving us already um, a closed form equation for multivariate fragility function. So I could say that the probability of having a safety factor smaller than a safety factor of interest is going to be conditioned on a set of input parameters. These input parameters are going to be different for uh, the weir or the gravity dam. So, for the weir, we're going to have cohesion, angle of friction, deep and spacing of F2 diaclase, um, reservoir elevation, and peak ground acceleration. And for the down, we're talking about cohesion, angle of friction, drain efficiency, um, reservoir elevation, and peak ground acceleration. Another thing here, this sigmoid expression that we have here, the H uh, function is going to be different for the weir and for the dam. It's also going to be different for the, um, if we're considering a safety factor of 1.1 or if we're considering a safety factor of 1.3. So um, the thing that is interesting here is that just by replacing the value of these input parameters, we can generate fragility functions. So for example, here we can generate a fragility surfaces for um, the gravity dam. And here there was as a function of the reservoir elevation and big ground acceleration. And we can do the same thing for the free crested weir. Um, in this case, it was as a function of cohesion and angle of friction. In the same manner, we can generate, uh, oops, we can generate um, traditional seismic fragility curves. And this was the case only for the gravity dam, but we decided to do here an expedite safety assessment to show that considering a slightly different safety factors, um, sorry, so we consider slightly different safety factors. And here we also consider vertical values of PGA corresponding to the different editions of the National Building Code. 
And the main idea here was to show that the combination of slightly different safety factor together with uh, outdated seismic hazard um, values can provide very different fragility estimates. So that's going to be uh, a big source of uncertainty in our analysis. So um, now what we want to do is to use our fragility functions so we can evaluate down performance and we can formulate recommendation to achieve an expected or desired performance. And to do this, we are going to have to define some target probabilities. Um, those are normally defined on international guidelines, but um, it's going to be also um, normally for extreme events. So if we want to work with any other type of event, which is not extreme, uh, we have to define those specific events in terms of return periods. And here we're not going to have any target probability. So we decided to use a verbal mapping system, which is going to give us a qualitative probability. And the idea here was to work closely uh, with the industry so we can have their uh, engineering judgment and see like how comfortable they are with different target probabilities. So this verbal mapping system, it's here on the table. So we're going to, the first thing that we do here is to assign an event likelihood that varies from virtually certain to virtually impossible. Then we're going to assign a probability to that. And then we're going to consider uh, the seismic events in terms of the return period. So um, for a virtually impossible earthquake, we're considering that it's a return period of um, 10,000 years. And um, this value is provided by international guidelines. So it says that the absolute probability must be smaller than 6%. And this corresponds to the maximum um, considered earthquake. Very unlikely was for a seismic event of 2,475 years. And we assume an aside probability of 1%. Unlikely was, to, uh, was um, 20%, sorry and uh, we assign a return period of 10,000 years. So what are we trying to do here? Well, basically we're going to have our fragility function and we're going to intersect that fragility function with horizontal planes of constant target probability. And then we're going to project that intersection so we can estimate um, parameter combinations that they're going to give us the probability of having a safety factor is smaller than a safety factor of interest. And that uh, probability needs to be smaller than our target probability. So here the idea is saying, uh, talking to um, practicing engineers and telling them, if you have a safety factor that is smaller than a safety factor of interest, we know that that, that doesn't mean that the structure is going to collapse but we want to know how comfortable you are with that. So we said that if the probability of having a safety factor that is not respecting the, um, the target safety factor, it's a smaller than let's say 10% for a seismic event of 2,475 years, they're comfortable with that. So with this methodology, we can vary that um, assigned probability. So um, that's basically what we did. And I'm going to be showing you all of the results for the gravity dam, but it's going to be the same idea if we're working here with um, the free crested weir. So here we have a fragility surface as a function of the reservoir elevation and the drain efficiency. And we have it for return periods of 2,475, 10,000 years and 1,000 years. So here we're just going to intersect each of the surfaces with horizontal planes, and we're going to project that. Okay, so here we have the combination of parameters, okay, that we are respecting different uh, probabilities that we see here. So by limiting the assigned probability, we can define non allowable values, allowable values, and we can see where it falls, uh, the combination that they use for a deterministic analysis. So we can see that if we're looking at the 10,000 um, return period seismic event, all of the possible combinations of reservoir elevation and drain efficiency 
are within the allowable values because all of the values that we see here, which are the probability, are smaller than 0.2. We can do the same analysis with a return period of 2,475. So here we're going to limit uh, the probabilities to 10%. So we can see that all of the green uh, zone are allowable values. However, for the 10,000 return period, we can see that um, we cannot consider any of the combinations because we're not going to be respecting this 6%. And we can see also how, where it falls, the um, combination that we use for the deterministic analysis. We can do the same uh, exercise here if we consider cohesion and angle of friction. So, we can see where we're going to have non-allowable values, allowable values, and where it falls, um, the combination that they use for the deterministic analysis. So um, we have our fragility functions. We can show those regions, but we know that we have a lot of uncertainty because this probability uh, framework depends on the input that we're giving. So we want to know how we can reduce the uncertainty so we can increase the understanding and the confidence in our fragility estimates. So uh, traditional things that we can do for this is gathering more, more data, perform uh, some kind of monitoring, or even a more in-depth analysis of the natural hazard or system configuration. However, it might happen that the efforts, they don't lead to a significant reduction in uncertainty. That's why here we have an advantage when we're working with uh, parametrized fragility, because we have a flexibility to describe a variety of possible scenarios. So to reduce uh, the uncertainty, we decided to update the model parameter knowledge by performing a multidimensional integration. So here we're convolving our fragility function with updated probability density function for each one of the input parameters. So basically here we're trying to marginalize our multivariate fragility functions. And at the same time, we're back propagating uh, the posterior uncertainty. So um, here in this table, I have the updated distribution for uh, each of the parameters. As you can see now, most of the distributions are log normal before we were working with a uniform distribution. And for example, for the cohesion and the angle of friction, uh, we perform some more exhaustive field measurements uh, to obtain this kind of distribution. For drain efficiency and reservoir elevation, uh, those are based on historical data of our dam. And for peak ground acceleration, we chose um, to work with uh, 50 accelerograms that were selected consistent with the seismicity at the dam site. And we extracted the PGA from the records and we fit the distribution. So um, now that we have our updated uh, distributions, we want to see how is it going to impact our results if we're not updating the knowledge of all of the parameters at the time? Uh, because it might happen that we don't have enough economical resources to update all of them at the same time. So um, we decided to see the impact of updating one of them, yes, and the other ones, no. So uh, we decided to work uh, or to take into consideration the parameter affecting the most the structural response. So to do this, we performed uh, some sensitivity analysis, uh, such as a tornado diagram, a multi-way ANOVA, and some low indices. And from all of these um, cases, from all of this analysis, sorry, we uh, figure out that cohesion is the parameter introducing the most uh, variation in, in our safety factor. And in practice, cohesion is one of the most difficult parameters to determine accurately. That's why we thought that it was going to be convenient for the industry if we can give them some idea of which values of cohesion they should use. So uh, we, we want to formulate recommendation uh, in terms of the cohesion values to respect a safety factor with a given qualitative confidence. So to do this, we develop fragility curve as a function of cohesion. Uh, then we look at seismic events with um, a return period of 2,475 years. We can change that. We can use whatever return period we want to work with. And then we decided to sequentially generate fragility curves by updating the knowledge of one parameter at a time. 
And then by intersecting those fragility curves with a, a qualitative probability, we determine minimum values. So here we can see from the red curve, by intersecting that with the qualitative probability, that if we don't perform any update uh, of the knowledge of the parameters, we need a cohesion value of around uh, 2,000 kilopascals to respect that qualitative probability. However, if we improve the knowledge of the seismic hazard at the dam site, that value is reduced 65%. If in addition to that, we also improve the knowledge of the drain efficiency, that value is going to be reduced 95%. And we can also see here that uh, the angular friction and the reservoir have a negligible effect in our results. So um, in the same manner, I can uh, reproduce the same exercise, but this time, instead of doing a sequential analysis, I could say what's going to happen if I have economical resource, resource, resources sorry, uh, to update the knowledge of one, two, three, or four parameters at the time. So here we have a matrix for um, the safety factor of 1.3 or a safety factor of 1.1. Uh, the values here in the vertical um, column next to the names, those are the values of just modifying, uh, those are the minimum cohesion values of just modifying um, each of these parameters. And all of the other parameters are the intersection of um, two of these values. So let's say that we're looking at uh, the, the 1,394. That's the minimum cohesion value that I need if I'm updating the knowledge of the angle of friction and drain efficiency. So by doing this, uh, sorry, and we perform the same analysis by modifying two, three, or four parameters at a time. So by doing this, we can see that if I only have enough resources to modify one parameter, we should be looking at this first column. So definitely the minimum value is going to be given by improving the knowledge of the seismic hazard at the dam site. If we have enough for two parameters, it's going to be definitely uh, improving the knowledge of, of the seismic hazard and drain efficiency. Three parameters is going to be seismic hazard, uh, drain, um, drain efficiency, and angle of friction. And we can see that even modifying four parameters at the, uh, the dams, uh, four parameters at the time, the minimum value of cohesion that we have to ensure at the dam site is going to be 90 kilopascals if we want to uh, meet the expected performance for a safety factor of 1.3. We can do exactly the same for the free crested weir. So here we have to the left, the sequential analysis, and here we have the, um, we have the matrix where we are modifying one or two parameters at a time. So if we only have enough resources to modify one parameter, we should be focusing on uh, improving the knowledge of the upper and dip of uh, the F2 diaclase uh, family. And if we have enough to modify two parameters at the time, we should be looking at improving the upper and dip and the seismic hazard, or improving the seismic hazard and the reservoir elevation. Because these two are going to allow us to uh, neglect the value of cohesion in our, in our analysis. So for the conclusions, um, the use of a statistical concepts, it's indispensable for the reduction of uncertainty and consequent evaluation of uh, the safety of structures. The use of parametrized multivariate fragility functions uh, offer great, uh, greater flexibility in exploring different scenarios while optimizing um, the computational resources. For the case study dam, it is not worth investing in additional studies for the angle of friction and the reservoir management. Uh, similarly, for the free crested weir, it is not worth investing in additional studies for the angle of friction and the spacing of the diaclase family F2. Um, the, and finally, the proposed methodology considers the anticipated value of the additional effort uh, to reduce uncertainty as a criterion for selecting an action plan. Also, I want to add here that uh, further studies are needed to optimize um, the quantity and the quality of the analysis required to train surrogate models. And yeah, that's what's here. Yeah. 
Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Rocio, for your presentation. Uh, now it's time for questions. I don't know if anyone attending wants to make any question to Rocio. Uh, if so, please let us know some way, either in the chat or directly uh, speaking. Uh, in the meantime, I would like to make a couple of questions. I have a number of them, uh, but uh, probably the, the most important one of my curiosities about uh, um, how this results uh, affected the, the, the decision making process of on one hand of, of the dam owners, but also I'm very interested in knowing how uh, this, let's say, new methodology uh, was uh, uh, received by the, I guess that in Canada has been some uh, authority for dam safety, and I guess that there would be some uh, dam safety regulation that's probably, let's say, doesn't include this, this concept. So how, how what impact did, did this research had on both on the dam owner and also on the dam safety authority? Yeah, definitely. So, um... What happened here is that we decided to work especially with cohesion. That was a requirement for, uh, for them. Uh, because again, when they start the analysis, they're just going to use uh, like very, very wide parameters. And they're going to try to use a minimum of cohesion. Um, but in this case, like sometimes they, they're using the value, like a really small value of cohesion, and that's still not, um, achieving the factor of safety that they want. So uh, by giving them something like that, where they say like, okay, let's try to improve the knowledge of the other parameters so we can uh, not use cohesion, that's allowed them to say like, okay, it's not that the dam is not safe. I mean, it's only that the way that we're looking at it, it's not maybe instead of having a factor of safety of three, they're having a factor of safety of 2.8. So by being able to ignore cohesion, for example, here, and being able to reach that target value, that was very, very useful for them. I mean, this table was actually what was most useful for them. Um, so that's in terms of the industrial partner, how they're going to be applying this uh, in terms of, a, a, let's say like a nation, uh, national guidelines, I'm not quite sure the, the way it works is like each uh, province of each state, they have their own guidelines. Um, so I'm hoping that this is going to be a start point to start talking about this. Um, and we can kind of like shift from working all the time with the safety, um, with the factor of safety and moving more to a performance based um, analysis, which also has been proven to be um, effective when working with buildings and bridges. So I think, I hope that it's going to uh, kickstart that uh, that line of thought. Mm -hmm. I see. So this was more, I mean, uh, the interest of the dam owner in, in getting more comfortable, let's say, with the with the as they had and how safe the dams uh, were, right? Okay. And yeah. I also was curious about, I have a doubt about the, how the, uh, did you go back in the presentation when you talk about the different the two layers of the, of the methodology? The first one is quite clear, you are applying a regression to yeah. estimate those qualities of interest. So you are somehow replacing the, the numerical model with this regression model. But uh, how, I'm not sure if I understood why the classification part. Uh, you mentioned that you generated, I think, that 10,000 uh, uh, 10, uh, realizations, right, of the, of the yeah. formations of the parameters. I guess that, that you plug those values into the, your regression, your first survey, right? Yeah. And then yeah. How, how was the second step? How did you fit the classification model? And what is our, what's the difference between, uh, you have a table that said it was not, uh, or what was accurate, but there were some, some, some uh, errors, I guess, in the classification model, right? So, mm -hmm. What's the difference between uh, applying the specification uh, method to the results of the first surrogate or just looking at the results of the regression and, and 
I did. I think I missed something in that part. Yeah, sure. So um, basically, uh, when we're working with this um, with Kalam 3D, it has the advantage the software that we use. We have the advantage that it's pretty, pretty, um, an expedite analysis is pretty fast. So we could definitely kind of like avoid using a regression first. However, what happened is because we were varying also the geometry, um, we cannot do that with Kadam. Like we cannot automate the simulations. So we have to do that by hand each time. So we decided to uh, generate a regression with only uh, 200 samples. And it was working very well. And then we decided to use that to generate more samples to do a classification. Because the thing like, uh, it's that if we just jump with the classification, we have a lot of values that they are like close to zero. So that's giving us uh, some numerical instability. So we decided to uh, use our regression to generate more samples for our classification. And um, the thing is like, we just wanted to uh, use a classification surrogate because it's directly giving us an expression for, multivari for um, multivariate fragility functions. So in the case that we don't need to vary the geometry, we can definitely ignore this uh, regression step and jump into the classification. Because the inputs are the same, right? I can see it here. For both the models, inputs are the right? same, mm -hmm. yes. Exactly. So you, can the same. Directly, you can directly plug some values of these uh, random variables that you, you consider and uh, into the classification model and get and get the result, right? Yeah, exactly. I see. And so the, the point is to be able to have this, uh, this uh, function from which you can later uh, derive the fragility functions, right? Yes, exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Uh, well, I don't know if there is uh, no one said anything. Uh, if there's any other question from anyone else. Uh, if not, uh, I, I think we can finish at this point. Ignasi, I don't know if you have anything to comment on that. Okay, so thank you very much, Rafia, for this very uh, nice presentation, and uh, see you in the next uh, seminar. Definitely. Thank you so much for having me.